Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And today I'm going to tackle a subject uh, that is a very simple subject, but I thought it might be a blessing to many of you that are watching. Uh, and it's about the scripture where uh, when God is speaking to Moses and Moses talks about that he is slow of speech. Uh, he's slow of tongue. And this is something that many scholars believe that uh, Moses had a speech impediment or he stuttered. Uh, different ideas have come about as it regards to why, did, uh, why was this spoken about in the Bible by Moses <clears throat> and then why he ends up having to have Aaron to be a spokesman for him. And I do believe I know the answer to this and it's not the mainstream theology behind it at all, but I believe it's truly supported by biblical um, research and something that I think will be a blessing to you. There's also another very fascinating thing that I discovered in, in doing this study here and uh, and I really look forward to share this with you as well. Um, and, and, and a little small thing I'm going to share with you just right here in the very beginning here I think will be a blessing to you as we get into this whole process about uh, why did Moses actually have a slow tongue and slow of speech. So, at any rate, uh, the one thing that I'll be getting into that I saw as I was studying this, I'll share a little insight with you, uh, but the depth of this belongs more on Patreon, our, uh, our channel where we load more controversial subjects. But I'll share a little bit with you here, just so you kind of know where I'm, what, what thoughts are coming to my heart as God reveals things to me. Uh, and we, we don't do that, especially here on the Noon Institute, because the controversial issues are something that we don't want to risk losing this channel uh, for because it's a teaching channel and we want you to be able to be blessed and the people that come in large numbers here can be blessed by those insights that God gives me without the risk of losing the channel which would make it far more difficult for people to be able to find us later. But anyway, Patreon, and of course that's also another way you can support the work we're doing here. If you go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash Israeli News Live, that's where we load those controversial videos. Um, and of course we have our Israeli News Live channel on YouTube. We have it on live stream under the same name, different places you can find us if for some reason they ever begin to shut us down in different places. And of course IsraeliNewsLive.org, uh, our website, which is another way to be able to find us and to get updates on what's going on. At any rate, though, uh, let's get started into this, and I love to read Hebrew. It's just so exciting for me to get to read it, and I don't always read a lot of it. Uh, but I want to read several verses here. It just seems to set an atmosphere when you use the Hebraic language, the very uh, language that God gave to the children of Israel and the revelation of His Word through His prophets have always come through the Hebraic language. Even in the Gospels, uh, they say that it was Greek or Latin was the language, or not Latin, but Greek, and that's totally false. Uh, there is sufficient evidence that supports the Hebrew was the language. In fact, the early church fathers spoke about how Matthew wrote in the Hebrew tongue. And uh, Nehemi Gordon did a beautiful message on uh, Shem Tob's Hebrew gospel and he really took the nuances of the of the language and showing how it just doesn't work in Greek and how that when it was brought out in the Hebrew language that Shem Tob's Hebrew gospel clearly even though it was from I think around the 1300 13th century it clearly was a work that was copied from much much older scripts uh, and it is believed to be probably one of the most accurate sources of uh, the Hebrew of the Gospels uh, themselves. Uh, and I'm actually, I've worked before on translating this in English more properly, uh, and I'm going to continue to work on that because as I share those insights with you, I'm going to start referring more back to this because it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. And, uh, and it's not much different than what we see in English today. It's just little key things uh, that, that even I've seen. I even noticed, like for example, the example of Matthew 24, when it speaks about this gospel be uh, preached to all the world, 
you can clearly see in the Hebrew language is speaking about the two witnesses. Uh, when this gospel goes to all the world, then the end will come. It's just the way Yeshua says it, the way Matthew recorded it in Hebrew. And that's actually where I got the revelation of what it was, was from Shem Tob's translation of, or, or the copy that he had of the Hebrew uh, Matthew, the, the book of Matthew in the Hebrew, Hebrew language. So very fascinating book, and I just encourage you, you can get a copy of it yourself. The translation that Shem Tob did, or whoever did his translation into English, uh, I'm a little skeptical on the accuracy of this, uh, because just my preference, but nonetheless, uh, that's why I'm doing my own translation of it as well. Let's get started. All right, we're in the book of Exodus, Hebrew, it's called Shemot, uh, verse th or chapter 3, or Gimel. Alright. <laughs> ויאמר משה משה ויאמר הנני ויאמר אל תקרב חולם של נעליך מאו רגליך כי המקום אשר אתה עומד עליו אדמת קודש הוא ויאמר אנוכי אלוהי אביך אלוהי אברהם, אלוהי יצחק ואלוהי יעקב. ויסתר, סיסמי, ויסתר משה פניו כי יורה מהביט אל האלוהים. ויאמר יחובה רואה ראיתי את אני עמי אשע במצרים ואת זקתם שמעתי מפני נגשיו. כי ידעתי את מחה אביו. ויורה לחצילו מיד מצרים ולכלותו מן הארץ הכי. אל ארץ טובה ורחבה, אל ארץ זבת חלב ודבש. אל המקום הכנני וח... וחכיתי וחמורי וחפורזי ו... וכחי חבי ויבוסי. ואתה הנה צעקת בני ישראל באה אליו וגם ראיתי את חל... סקיוס מי. הלחץ אשר מצרים ולחצים אותם. ואתה לך ואשלך אל פרו. וחוצי אל עמי בני ישראל ממצרים. ויאמר משה אל אלוהים, מי אנוכי? כי אליך אל פרעה, וכי אוציא את בני ישראל ממצרים? ויאמר, כי אהיה עמך, וזה לך האות, כי אנוכי שלחתך, בחוציך את העם ממצרים, תעבודון את האלוהים על חכה הזה. ויאמר משה אל האלוהים, הנה אנוכי בא אל בני ישראל, ואמרתי להם אלוהי אבותיכם שלחני אליכם, ואמרו לי, מה שמו? מה אומר אליכם? אליכם. ויאמר אל אלוהים אל משה, יהיה אשר יהיה. ויאמר כה תאמר לבני ישראל, יהיה שלחני אליכם. 
ויאמר אור אלוהים אל משה, כה תאמר אל בני ישראל, יחובה אלוהותיכם, אלוהי אברהם, אלוהי יצק ואלוהי יעקב שלחני. אליכם זה שמי לעולם וזה זכרי לדור הדור. And we'll kind of stop right there. I'll go back. We'll start in English. Um, it's just so beautiful, you know, so rich when you read there and, and just the, the expression and the feeling and the passion. And I always enjoy reading this. And I know some people that are studying Hebrew, it helps too, you know, just to kind of know how you pronounce these things, which always better to learn from a native Israeli uh, speaker than myself. Uh, but by God's grace, we just try to do the best we can. We get in here, though, and of course, as we see in the very beginning, God is, uh, Moses is keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and uh, he's led to the, leads the flock to the farthest uh, side of the wilderness or the desert here, Hamid Bao, and he came to the mountain of God unto Horeb, which is the mountain of God. It's also, we call this Mount Sinai because of the burning bush itself. It's the eighth Sinai that is on the bush. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Aineinu ochal. Uh, this is, uh, in other words, it was not eaten is the way we would actually translate that literally. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called unto him out of the midst of bush and he said, Moses, Moses. And of course, Moses says, here am I. You know, it's probably a fearful thing to hear the voice of God speaking like that. Uh, not that you're afraid, but It's just the, the, the majestic majesty of our Creator speaking to us. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off your shoes from off your feet. The place whereon that you stand is a holy ground. And then he goes on to say, and this is what really is beautiful. This is the first part I wanted to share with you before we get into the part about him being slow of speech and slow of tongue. Because I said to you, there was more than one beautiful revelation in here. So I'm going to turn with you here as we look at this. In verse 6 right here, and let me just kind of highlight this for you. Um, get the whole thing highlighted. It shows up a little bit better that way. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. Okay, ve'yomer anochi elochai avicha. That is a powerful statement that most people probably never give enough attention to. And I think maybe I've taught this before on Israeli News Live back years ago when we were a teaching channel, because I have taught this in times past as well. But this is a message directly to Moses. Because you have to understand, if we just jump back just for a moment, let's go to Exodus 2. In the beginning in Exodus chapter 2, we read that there went a man out of the house of Levi and took a wife of the daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him uh, in an ark, a bulrush, and daubed it with slime and with pitch. And she put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's bank. Okay, and, the, and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And, excuse me, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side, and she saw the ark among the flags and sent her maiden to fetch it. Now, you've got to keep in mind, that's also, it's a little different than what we see in the movies. We see the ark floating down, the crocodiles trying to eat the ark, and all this kind of good stuff, and that never actually happens. That's just Hollywood making it more dramatic. Uh, I kind of like the way they do it, but it does make it more dramatic, uh, but it's not actually what takes place. And it's very important to know the truth of what takes place, because the ark itself is daubed with pitch, which is, you know, it's put in this, this, this vessel that just so much is a type of the womb and that little child, that little baby is hidden within this womb, hidden amongst the reeds. Uh, and of course, as I've shared with you guys, you may not know this from the, uh, if you look at Israeli News Live, the, the intro video that we have on there, should have it really actually here on the Noon Institute. Uh, this is uh, about the story of Yom Suf, where God give me the revelation of this, how, why did God ever call the Sea of Reeds, uh, excuse me, the Red Sea, a Sea of Reeds? 
and it had a lot to do with a future fulfillment of the scripture and that would be where the children of Israel and the Bielski family the movie Defiance which by the way if you have Netflix watch it they have it on there now the movie Defiance depicts uh, Tuvia Bielski uh, rescuing his people and of course they are hidden in the wilderness fleeing from the Germans and at one point they cross this swamp in order to get to an island of refuge and he crosses through a sea of reeds and I've always believed that uh, as the scripture says I believe it's in uh, um, what is it Leviticus I think is where it's at uh, uh, maybe no I forget which book it is in now but anyway it says that the Lord uh, they will no longer say that the Lord liveth to deliver the children of Israel from the land of Egypt but they shall say the Lord liveth that he delivered the children of Israel from the land of the north in all other the countries whether he has driven them all right now it mentions all the world but why does it specifically mention the land of the north separate from uh, that of the rest of the world and I believe it was because the Bielski family delivered the children of Israel that were up in Belarus uh, the country of Belarus which was part of uh, been back and forth part of Russia part of Poland etc always fighting over there uh, but he carries these uh, eight, at that time it was 800 Jews went across a sea of reeds in order to get to this island and so when the basket of Moses is here in the midst of the reeds once again he is hidden he's hidden away for that purpose and I thought the basket was a type of the womb itself but that's not what I'm trying to get to here and she opened it and saw even the child and behold a boy that wept and she had compassion on him and said this is one of the Hebrews children she knew that he was a Hebrew child this said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she shall may nurse the child for thee and Pharaoh's daughter said her go and, and the maiden went and called the child's mother now that was a blessing of the Lord for the children for, for Moses as a little child at least he got to be with his mother his natural birth mother until he was weaned from the breast which would have probably been um, at least by the age of two years old at the very most he would have gone that long on her breast and what little bit of Hebrew he would have heard as a little baby would have never stuck with him uh, because then he is then taken back to Pharaoh's daughter and he is reared as an Egyptian and that's the part that I'm focusing on right now so if we jump back over here to Exodus 3 uh, as I say this you have to understand let's say two years old at the most three years old how much memory is Moses going to have at 40 years of age when he finally decides to go see his brethren he knows he you know the thing is I believe what it is it's a rumor it's been a rumor that he is actually Hebrew but there's still a doubt within Moses mind am I really a Hebrew am I not a Hebrew am I just a, an Egyptian or really am I one of them all right and he feels it in his heart that he is but he doesn't really know for sure uh, and I kind of grew up the same way you know I didn't know that I was uh, Jewish per se because in the early part of my life even when I was a child the, my parents my mother knew that she was Jewish but they wouldn't dare speak about it it was very much hidden very well kept secret uh, in our family and you know because of what happened uh, in the Holocaust there's so many of our family members that died uh, and how that our my mother's uh, grandfather came to America illegally before the Holocaust because they'd gone through the pogroms and my father's side had gone through uh, the uh, Spanish Inquisition and uh, so these were things that were kind of even kept in my own life uh, which that's many Jews that doesn't make me somebody special many people today find out they're Jewish and it was just hid from them because of that it's a norm it's a, it's a normal thing to happen but I believe that Moses also struggled was with was he Egyptian or was he really Hebrew was he a Jewish uh, man and I think that God is dealing with this issue right off the bat with Moses. He says, Ve'yomer, and it says, that literally means, and he said, speaking about God, 
Anochi Elohai, I am the God of Icha of your father. Okay? I am the God of your father. Not somebody else's father, your father. Then he shows him his father's lineage. Elohai, the God of Abraham, Elohai, Yitzhak, and Elohai, Yaakov. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. All right? So he settles for Moses once and for all who he really is. He now knows without any question he is a Hebrew. He is a he is not an Egyptian. And then the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people that are in Egypt, and I have, I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for now I know their pains, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now this is another important uh, uh, passage right here that I think is really kind of overlooked right here. Okay, and, and that is, God says here, let me pull this up a little higher for you guys. I kind of changed the way the the TV actually sits here in the in the room uh, because my chair is always too high. So we readjusted this here. All right. So God says here, ve uh, which means I and, and come down la hitzelo miad mitzrayim. I've come down to deliver from the from the Egyptians from that from the hand of the Egyptians. Okay, he says I've come down, and now see God is saying this in a personal pronoun. He has come down to deliver the children of Israel. But then he goes on to say, as he says this, and to bring them out of the land into a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey, etc. Uh, where the Canaanites, the Perizzites, etc. And he says, Now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, moreover I have seen the oppression. Then he goes, Now come now therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people. So even though God uses that personal pronoun through the Hebrew language, that he's coming down, he's the one that has seen it, he's the one that's going to deliver, then he says, I'm sending you. Alright, so truly God will come but he has his messenger that he uses. And I think that's kind of an interesting uh, insight as well. Let's, let's kind of shift a little bit, though. And uh, we're going to go to that part here in just a moment about, yeah, well, let's go ahead and go now to Exodus 4. Uh, and this is what's really important here. We're going to back up just a little bit here. I won't read as much Hebrew this time here. I just wanted to do that for a little blessing for those listening. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to the, to, unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto you. And the Lord said unto him, What is it in, in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground. It became a serpent, and Moses fled before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and laid a hold on it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. The Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thy hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. Uh, and when he took it, it behold, it, 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 his hand was as leprous as white as snow. And he said, Put thy hand back into thy bosom. And he put his hand back into his bosom. And when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, I just shared that with you guys the other day, the beautiful revelation about the voice of the sign as opposed to the physical miracles, the signs of the rod, the mate, to a serpent, nachash, and his hand from leprosy to not leprosy. He says, It shall come to pass if they will not believe even these two signs, neither hearken unto, the, unto thy voice. That's how we know, by the way. And I don't know if I clarified that enough yesterday or the day before yesterday. When he says, Ve'yaha'im lo ya'aminu gam lishne. Okay? If they will not hear, the, the, the vo uh, excuse me, if, they will, if it comes to pass, if they will not believe these two signs, ha'otot, that's the signs, ha'ele, these, these two signs, it's kind of backwards in Hebrew, ve'losh isha'an le'kolecha, 
and they will not hear your voice. That's how you know he separates the voice, the sign of the voice, from that of the sign of the two signs, the, the snake to a serpent, or excuse me, the stick to a serpent, and his hand to leprosy. That thou shalt take the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon dry land. That's very serious, friends. And this, I believe, is the fulfillment, or will be the fulfillment, uh, of your two witnesses. They will literally take water from a river. And when God instructs them, after they have been rejected in their ministry, God will speak to them and they will take water from the river and they will pour it upon the land. And it will become blood. The blood, though, is going to be from the two-thirds that have rejected God's word and that will perish as a result of this. And Moses said unto the Lord, I am not a man of words, neither hereto nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of a slow tongue. This is what caught my attention right here. Now, it's interesting because Moses, although he is showing him these supernatural signs that he's doing, he is saying to him that, you know, O oh Lord, I am not a man of words, neither here hitherfore, nor since thou hast spoken to me. In other words, I, there was no miracle that changed my ability, even since I've been speaking to you. You, you show these, me these miracles, but I have not seen the miracle with my tongue yet. Now, in Hebrew he says, Ve'yomer Moshe el Yehova, bi Adoni, lo ish davrim anochi gam mitomol gam Mi shilasham, okay. I am, I am. Uh, you know, Moses says to the Lord, okay. Oh Lord, I, I, I am not a man of words. Anochi gam, not since you mitomo, uh, uh, not since before or began milasham not even to, to right here right now gem mi mi az deberecha el avodecha okay so he's not only is he not a man of words but he's uh, even the actions avodecha he can't even do it ki kovod pe all right now watch what he says for i am slow I have a literally kavod pe. His mouth is slow. U kavod leshon, and his tongue is slow. Okay, anochi. So I have I have a slow mouth and a slow tongue. Now they they believe that this is because of a speech impediment. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the man dumb, or deaf, seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, okay? I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. Alright? Now, this is telling me something, and if I look at what is going on in Moses' life, and then I compare this with the book of Acts, in chapter 7, when Paul writes, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of who? The Egyptians. And he was what? Mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. He was trained and taught and he was mighty with his words and in deeds. Totally opposite of what Moses is saying over here in Exodus 4. You know, he's over here saying that he's slow of speech. And even in, in his works, all right, Abu Da, you know, everything that, that Paul says in Acts 7 is just the opposite of what Moses' confession is before the Lord here. All right, but what's the difference though? 
What, you know, it should come to pass, okay, wait, I'm sorry, wrong verse, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I am not a man of words. Ve'yomer Moshe el Yehova, be Adoni. Lo ish davrim anochi gam mitamov, gam mish shlisham, gam meaz, meaz, daberacha el avodecha. Okay? Avodecha is, is, is works, what he can do. He's slow in his words, he's slow in his, and, and what he can do, totally opposite of what Paul writes about. But there's one difference though, all right? The difference is, Moses was like this, he was powerful in his words and in his deeds, but it was with what? He was trained by the Egyptians. So Moses knew the Egyptian language. Moses was reared by Pharaoh's daughter and learned the Egyptian language and that really became the native tongue of Moses. Now, I believe that Moses knew Hebrew a little bit, but because it was not a native tongue for him being raised in Pharaoh's house, he was slow at speaking. He was not able to do much and when it says that, uh, you know, when Moses makes the argument before God, you know, and he even says, you know, he tells him here, Gam me, me az, uh, el avodecha. He's, not, he's, he's slow with his words and with his actions. You know, because he's not able, he feels, I believe, that he's trying to, you know, God has called him to go and deliver the children of Israel. You know, it's not that he couldn't speak to, to the Egyptian Pharaoh, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was he was having, he doesn't know how to go convey this to the children of Israel. And that's where the problem comes in. And I think it's always interesting too that he asked, he asked them, he said, they're, they're gonna, the one thing they're going to ask me immediately is me is, what is your name? What do I say to them? Now God doesn't say, tell them my name is Yehovah. He says, tell them, Ihaye Asha Ihaye has sent you. Alright, so he's already teaching him the, the Hebrew words because Moses doesn't seem to know. And then it goes on, you know, he gets into this argument with God over the fact that he doesn't do it. And God says, I will, you know, he says, now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth. Ve'ata lecha. Lech, excuse me, Veata Leah Anochi Ihaye Impecha. I will be with your mouth. You know, the point was Moses makes the argument that since you've spoke to me, you did this miracle, okay, this my staff turned to a serpent, my hand turned to leprosy, and you healed it instantly, but since you did all this, my mouth is still I can't speak Hebrew yet. It's pretty much what he's saying to God. All right? And so God says to him, he's wanting him to have faith and believe is what God is wanting. God is wanting Moses to believe. And Moses is not believing at that moment. He's looking at only what he can see with his physical eyes. And so God says to him, I will be with your mouth. All right? And then he says, Ve'harotecha ashar and I will teach you what to say. Or, or, or I will literally, I will teach you your words. Okay? There it is. Tedaber. I will teach you what to speak or what the, what the words are supposed to be. God, and here's what's so beautiful, friends. Moses should have known this is being reared in the, in, the, in the house of Egypt. Because if there were any records back then of Joseph, uh, like we have today, the book of uh, Jeshur, uh, Yashad is actually how you pronounce this. And I know there's differing opinions about the authenticity of this book. And I'm not here to dispute those issues there. But if you look at the book of Jeshur, the one element that they did not want uh, Joseph to become Pharaoh, there was the argument with Pharaoh at the time, not Pharaoh, but to become Pharaoh's right-hand man, to become the prince of, uh, of Egypt, so to speak, 
was that he did not know not only the Egyptian tongue, but they recorded in the book of Jasher that you had to know the 70 languages of the known world to be the right-hand man to Pharaoh. And Joseph only knew Hebrew. He did not even know Egyptian. And, uh, and probably like Moses, maybe just a little tiny bit, but nothing fluently. But in the book of Jeshu, we read that the angel of the Lord appeared that night unto Joseph and taught him all 70 languages supernaturally that night. So here God is speaking with Moses. Moses should know the story of Joseph. He should know that God is more than capable of being able to give him what he needs. But then Moses still continues um, to doubt that ability that God can actually do it. And he says, and he says, O Lord, send, I pray thee, uh, by the hand of him thou wilt sin. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron thy brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And he said, And thou shalt speak unto him, and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. All right, so the thing is, there's no doubt, uh, it was more than likely, too, that Aaron could speak the Egyptian language. So you speak to him. So he didn't have a problem with speaking with his brother. He could speak to him in the Egyptian tongue, probably. Uh, and, and again, this is a conjecture. I can't say that I'm exactly 100% right on this, but it's just very interesting when you look at this. And he says, I will be with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So... <laughs> And of course, uh, when he says he'll be with his mouth, you have to remember too the uh, avodecha. What what you do that that's another very important issue that's written here. When he says I'll be with your mouth, that's also in the power of God's might. In other words, what they said would come to pass, uh, and that also comes into the part of the voice of the sign. There was a voice of the sign that went with the staff and the hand of leprosy, but there was also the voice of the sign, and that was whatever Moses said would come to pass. And then God says to him, if they do not uh, believe these two signs, neither the voice of the sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Now the latter sign has never been fulfilled. And this is one reason why I hold to the belief that Moses will have to return to fulfill the prophecy of the voice of the latter sign. And oddly enough, if it be that it is God anointing two men to carry this out, uh, I would have to say you will probably run into the same problem again. I have a feeling it's going to be someone that is not fluent in Hebrew. But perhaps this time, the Spirit of Moses upon him will cause him to realize that God is able to be with your mouth because they will believe the voice of the latter sign. By the way, I, I said I would share with you uh, something that I'll be bringing out on Patreon later today. Just a little insight uh, that I think would be of an interest to you. Uh, but it's not something I can really share here on uh, Danoon Institute because it is very controversial as well. Uh, the more important thing is it would cause my channel to be targeted uh, by those that don't want you to know the truth. But you remember how that God says uh, to Moses that he would give them favor with the Egyptians and that they were to borrow those things from the Egyptians. And in doing so, it would literally spoil the Egyptians. Now, that's never been requested of God in this day of the children of Israel. But Daniel does speak about the violent among our people that would try to establish a vision here in the latter days. That's another one of those prophecies that was fulfilled during the time of the Exodus, but is very much trying to be reenacted today. I'll go into more detail on Patreon about that. Uh, if you take a chance to uh, come over there and, 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 and join us, I'm sure you will find some very interesting things on Patreon. I'm Stephen Bernoon. You're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.